So now I'll clean up the board. You can see the little uh, nipples of solder hanging off there from all the rework over the years. So we'll get rid of that to start with. Alright champion, so all the eyelets are cleared of solder, but she's still looking absolutely disgusting. So, how do we get rid of that wax? I'll show ya. It's the way I do it anyway, it's probably other ways just as valid. Hot air station up to max. Not max temp, just uh, max fan, around 250 degrees, something like that. Your hot air gun would be quicker like a paint stripper type gun. All right, so that's got most of the wax off. Um, now we've just got crusty flux uh, and a little bit of wax residue. You're never gonna get the wax out of the fiber of the board because it's literally been dipped. Um, but it's the surface wax we wanna get rid of because that's what collects the dirt and stuff from the atmosphere and, and enables it to conduct over time. So I'll just give it a soak with some ISO and uh, it evaporates reasonably quickly. Not as quickly as like shellite or something, but I'll um, put another towel on top of it and then apply some to that. No smoking, of course, <laughs> goes without saying. We'll just let that soak into the flux for a little while and come back and give it a scrub. Boards are clean and repopulated. Got the original blue film caps in there, they cleaned up okay, got the wax off them. New bypass caps everywhere, tube amp doctor, 105 degree rated. We reused the um, resistors that weren't uh, out of tolerance and that didn't have their leads all mangled up and we replaced some components uh, The reverb uh, mixer there for example, I replaced with a metal film for lower noise uh, But overall just clean the board I tested it with the mega up to a thousand volts and there's no sign of leakage uh, between any two eyelets now So that is fantastic and there's our little bias board ready for installation as well so we'll get them back in here and then we'll start rewiring everything and uh, replacing the wiring that was uh, melted that we, we removed. Doing the mains wiring, blah, blah, blah. And carry on. All right, champion, she's back together. It's time to pack her up and fire her up. And try it on the Variac first, see where the bias sits. We might have to adjust that since it came in uh, in a pretty shocking state and who knows what working condition um i'm gonna check the bias and everything before we uh we get, go doing any sound test just to see if that needs tweaking from a safety point of view and uh then we're gonna just monitor the thing make sure everything's stable no oscillations that kind of thing and um check the pots are all good all the usual stuff and then we'll start getting into uh some some tone chasing i guess I've got it more or less stock at the moment besides some changes to the power supply, uh, like what nodes attached to what. Um, instead of having an unused node um, after the screen grid, we've moved uh, the phase inverter to its own node and uh, separated that from, from all the others. So that should help us a little bit. And uh, we're going to do some slight mods to the voicing. I'll show you with and without grid stop to the PI and, uh, and just check that everything's healthy and happy and Harold only Aussies will get that joke all right champion so a quick look inside um, the board's all nice and clean now there's a little bit of flux residue on there still from uh, wherever the soldering took place but not the end of the world much neater wiring a lot of wiring removed almost uh, probably over 50 percent of the wiring replaced because it was melted uh, and I wasn't happy with it 
I've just got my test leads attached there for the first startup. We've got our new cap down there. New solder connections removed from the transformer hardware. A little bias board down there with its own uh, ground there uh, combined with the fusible resistors, uh, balance resistors on the heater. The power switch disconnected. The unused primary windings uh, just bunched up there. What I do is I fold the lead back over on itself and then put a bit of heat shrink on it. Because if you just heat shrink the end of a wire, the heat shrink could pull off. Uh, this way the heat shrink's anchored on there, you're not getting it off and there's no possibility of any exposed uh, wiring finding its way down there and touching that because that's primary. Just cable tied neat, you know, out of the way. Got our dedicated uh, safety ground there, safety earth uh, on a clean soldered connection with enough slack on the cable that if this cable does get pulled out somehow, It'll pull the uh, connections off the switch here, uh, but still leave the, um, the safety earth attached. That'll be the, the last thing to become disconnected if the wire gets pulled clear of the amp. All right, I just removed my test leads for clarity. Um, regarding the power, we've got our active coming in here. Um, our color codes are different to you guys in the States. Black is active, white is neutral over there. Over here, and I think in Europe, brown is active and blue is neutral. So it comes straight in the, the core there with the, the retainer to the fuse tip, and then from the fuse ring to the switch, and that goes to the active input of the primary, the power transformer, and then the neutral comes in straight to the switch and then straight to the transformer. So if you can, uh, a dual pole switch is is preferable so the um, transform is completely isolated from the mains when it's switched off so we've reused the film caps where possible when when there was a value change or um, for example one of the uh, ends pulled off one of the caps from probably previous abuse uh, that was replaced but uh, where we could these blue caps are actually pretty good if they're not abused or overheated with a soldering iron so uh, we reused them. We'll see if there's any leakage, but I, I doubt there will be. Um, I tested them all beforehand. Where we've had to use a new resistor, we've gone with metal film. Uh, where we've had to use a new film cap, I've tried to use uh, Panasonic EC... I forget which one it is. ECQ or ECW series. I forget which one's which. We've got a new V-Shay there and a metal film 3.3 meg for the reverb mixer just to try and get the, the hiss level down a bit. But all the other carbon comps were tested for drift and reused if they weren't too far out of tolerance. Got a new 5 water there for the, the screen dropper. That's elevated off the board a little bit for airflow and if anything does go wrong so it doesn't char the board. The same goes for the first dropper there which was normally an 18 or 20k I think from memory but we've gone with a 10 there. And uh, we've got uh, the dropper there for the next node. Now, as mentioned before, uh, we didn't solder to the chassis for this. I put a can cap um, clamp through the existing holes. Didn't have to drill anything there, but we did have to enlarge the hole for the cap there. Uh, so I had to use the step drill, which was a pretty violent process. But once done and deburred, can't really tell the difference. If I was designing one of these from scratch, I'd, I'd try to use... Uh, probably a radial cap because even axials are getting expensive and uh, the quality in the future will probably go downhill and they're going to become like a, a um, legacy component rather than you know mainstream so if you can with new amp designs design them around radials please 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 got some backup diodes there which uh, will make life a bit easier for the rectifier and if it ever does go short they'll kick in instead of uh, going short circuit and delivering a uh, ac to that cap Get our new RCA socket there, so there's no more uh, random quarter inch jack there as well. It's all as per factory. I'll, I think I'll be replacing these, but in the meantime, we'll just use them for testing to see if they work okay. But um, yeah, I, I don't trust them at all to be reliable. So we'll put some switchcrafts on there. We'll look at the ones in the other end. Chances are they might be a bit better condition because they've been hidden away in the bag rather than exposed to the elements. Oh, panny boy, you love focusing, don't you? The front panel cleaned up okay-ish. Still got that corrosion under the finish, but um, no longer grease covered. And you can actually still read the uh, the labels. It's still legible, so it's about as good as we can do there. Got two new switchcraft jacks there with new resistors. So let's fire it up and give it a test, eh? We're on 38 watts. Voltage is coming up. You've got the B-plus on the left-hand side there as the 
Rectifier warms up. Now we're starting to conduct on the output stage with the right two meters measuring the drop across the primary of the output transformer. So, we're a little bit warm there. There's a pop. We're sitting around 100% there. And that's at 220 volts input on the mains. So when we're at 240, 250, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a bit hot. So I'll dial back that bias by changing the resistor to ground in the bias circuit and um, try again. All right, champion, so I fired it up and uh, we're getting about 10 watts out of it and some pretty nasty distortion when it's pushed hard. See that shit? That sounds fucking terrible. So uh, I'm not sure if that's coming from the phase inverter or beforehand, but I'm gonna have to do a bit of um, stage by stage testing and see where that's coming in and then focus in on it from there to find the problem. All right, so I found that the uh, distortion was occurring after V1B, and that happens to be the, the point that feeds the reverb. So on a hunch, I just removed the 12AT7 reverb driver and now that weird sort of wave foldery effect is no longer occurring. So I wonder if we might have a failed reverb drive transformer. I'll sub one in and we'll check it out. So before I went crazy changing the transformer, I thought let's just try another valve even though that was a brand new valve in the reverb driver position. And uh, no distortion. So brand new JJ's ECC81. 12AT7, maybe the culprit. Uh, these are getting pounded in this position because the voltages are high across the board, which is probably the next thing I'll address. Um, we might try another rectifier valve and see if we can drop that voltage down a little bit because that's pretty high across the board. Just to confirm I wasn't going crazy, I'll put the JJ's back in. And yeah, sure enough, it's got that weird um, dip happening halfway through there and the harder you push it the more terrible it sounds and the output power isn't um like it's at the start of that distortion you can see down there it's only pulling about eight volts rms across eight ohms you push it, it starts to distort at around it's pretty bad at around nine volts so it's limiting how far we can uh, push the output stage before it um before it starts giving that horrible distortion I've got a uh, electro harmonics I just had floating around in there to test out. You can see it's gone up to about 13 volts before uh, you get in the distortion. It is asymmetrical distortion, but that's one of the things we're going to change in the phase inverter. Make it a bit sweeter. But yeah, we're getting more power there before that crazy... Well, that crazy distortion isn't coming in. That's, ex that's the kind of distortion you expect from the uh, cathodine phase inverter in this configuration. So yeah. Shitty JJ. Oh, and shitty uh, Panny Boy focusing. What's new? Oh my god. So we've got a JJ's 5U4 in there now. Let's see what the difference is uh, with the voltages from this Philips 5AR4 that came in it. So we'll just flick her on. Let's see what it rises to. Whoa. <laughs> That's even worse. Okay, but it is dropping down to a more sane level. All right, so now the B plus is a bit saner, 430 instead of 450 something. So uh, we're aiming for 420, but our mains is a little bit higher. I think this transformer was wound for 220, as is often the case. Uh, but with the 5 u 4 in there, it jumps up a bit quicker. Um, it heats up quicker and start starts delivering the voltage to. Uh, to the output valves before they have a chance to warm up and, and uh, start conducting. So the voltage does peak at a higher level when you first switch it on, but then it calms down to a more sane level afterwards. All right, so next thing I was chasing some uh, kind of paper Terry sort of distortion -y sounds and uh, couldn't really find any definitive cause for it, but then I thought, let's just try the test speaker instead of the speaker in the cabinet, the Fat Jimmy and uh, all problems cleared. So that Fat Jimmy uh, sounds fucking terrible <laughs> for this amplifier. It's a real fizzy sort of paper Terry distortion. So I'll, I'll just show you right now the, uh, the difference between the two.
normally I've got nothing but love for the anything from WGS, but I'm not a big fan of that fat Jimmy. There's a lot of bottom end and a real raspy top end. Uh, don't know. Um, what I might do is we'll do the couple of voicing changes we were going to do anyway, because I, I, I feel that this amp pumps a bit too much low end into that little cabinet and little speaker. Uh, and we'll see if it's a little bit more graceful after that. And um, it's a taste thing as well back the treble off a little bit you, you're probably all right um we could put some slight treble cut uh, after the phase inverter however that's another option so what i might do is leave this apart while the customer's here we'll get him to try it out and we might be able to just just dial in the last 10 percent or so um there's my fucking phone right on cue every time i hit record for fuck's sake I've really got to remember to put that fucker on private when I'm working on stuff and particularly filming videos. Uh, I never said I was smart or professional, but you know, it is what it is. So another JJ's Bites of Dust. This one's actually still got vacuum, but not performing. Uh, well, you know, this circuit asks a bit much of these things at the best of times, so can't really blame JJ's for that. But yeah, where, where other brands uh, can cop it, JJ's cannot, so... Not sure if it's a one-off or if it's common to this actual manufacturer's part. Now I've just whacked a new set of uh, Tube Amp Dr. Red Bay 6 V6s in there and she's come up to about 75% but it's dragged down the B plus quite a bit. Uh, so it looks like the old valves are getting a little bit tired but they are still they are still functioning so I'll include a new set as an option um, and we, we can adjust the, uh, the bias to suit just pull it back down to about 60. All right, champions, it's time to get this thing back into the cabinet and uh, mic her up and have a listen. Just before we put it back in the cabinet, I'll just give you a look at that front area that was all covered in grease before. Got the new grounds there, a lot of new wiring, uh, a new pot there, and the new input jacks. Nice and clean, no WD-40. <laughs> One thing I might do before I put it back is uh, Use that unused switch now for a, uh, a little bright switch. So if he's using a Les Paul or something that's got slightly darker pickups, you can give it a bit of a kick in the uh, top end. Yeah, bugger it. Let's quickly do that. And there she is. All right, we'll get this thing back together and uh, have a listen. All right, all the valves reinstalled and we've replaced the missing uh, Novel valve covers, primarily for protection, but also... Uh, you know, it helps stop noise in V1 and V3 in particular. That's the preamp and the, the reverb return. We've cleaned up the uh, speaker connections there. We put a bit of a tighter twist on the cable too, just so everything stays together nice and neat. Just having a quick look inside the reverb tank. Connections are still good. And someone's, I don't know if it's from the factory or not, but someone's put a dab of silicon on each, uh, each of the conductors where they exit that sort of wafer. That's probably why they're still intact, because um, the little cable retaining clamp down there often cuts through the insulation or the whole wire itself. The RCA connectors on the tank look good. That one actually looks a little pressed in, but there's no movement there. So, And the plugs on the tank end look in much better condition, so they can, they can stay. So all in all, that's what was replaced. Various reasons for doing so. Uh... And countless hours. So the, these restos, man, they're killing me. But it's great to see these amps go. And to be honest, once I've spent so much time with an amp, I'm kind of sad to see it go. A lot of work and a lot of a lot of blood, sweat, and beers have gone into these amps. All right, so here she is, all back together. Just get a sense of the noise level. That's ten on the volume on whispering, and that's ten on the reverb. We're very quiet, champions. How's that for ASMR? So I just looked up the specs on this Fat Jimmy. It's a C1025, which is a 10 stands for 10 inch, 25 stands for 25 watt, 8 ohm. Um, their recommended speaker for a Princeton Reverb is the 1060, which is a 60 watt version. Uh, so I'm going to suggest to the customer that we upgrade this because now the amplifier is fully throated again. Um, says your mum. Uh, <laughs> we're at risk of blowing that speaker up. Um, so we'll take it easy with it. I'll talk to him. If he wants to take advantage of the sweet, um, really pushed overdrive sounds this amp can now offer uh, after the work done, he might want to think about upgrading that speaker. 
I've got a beautiful uh, ET65 down here in one of my cabinets. Uh, I'm building an amp to go in here. Another secret squirrel project, which I'll uh, fill you in on when it's uh, reached maturity. But we can try that out and get it, give him a sense of what the ET65 sounds. And I do have an ET10 in stock. If he wants to put that one in, we can do it on the spot. And FYI, that's not how you mount a bias pot nut. That lock washer is supposed to be on the inside, stopping the nut from rotating doesn't necessarily stop the pot body from rotating so we'll put that on the inside where it belongs and uh we'll have a more reliable ground connection to the chassis because it'll it'll bite into it a bit better too champions another epic ramp amp oh, fuck <laughs> <laughs> alright champions it's another epic amp repair sorry Michelle's laughing at me she's cruel tell her to get fucked uh, sorry I haven't had time to do many um, good sound samples I've got to, got to get some riffs and maybe a loop thing happening so I can compare A to B differences in the circuit as I enact them uh, different speakers that kind of thing when you're playing the different riff and uh, well, when you're playing a riff and then you change something and you pick up the guitar 10 minutes, 15 minutes later and, and play again, um, you, you're playing a little bit differently. You might be playing a different tempo, uh, not as hard or harder. Uh, so it's hard to directly compare unless we have some kind of uh, like a looper pedal perhaps. We might look down that road. Um, but, you know, this one's uh, gone well over schedule. Um, so I 
would like to do some more sound samples, but we're kind of running out of time on this one. So what do we learn from this one? Don't lubricate your amplifiers, please. I know it gives me more work, but um, I've got plenty of work how it is. Don't need more. So I hope you enjoyed that one, and I'll see you on the next one. Take it squeezy, champions.